Now moving on to actually applying that search strategy and step three, searching for the evidence. Now, even searching in a systematic review can look a bit different depending on the methodologies that are used and the questions asked. Looking at qualitative reviews, for example, you might see differences whether the search is considered to be exhaustive, which is what we'd normally do for a review of effectiveness, or is it saturation based? And some methodologies will only search until up to the point where they seem to be finding nothing new, and then they'll stop, which isn't what we'd see in a JBI review of effectiveness or a JBI qualitative review for that matter. This is a much more is a much bigger issue and it applies to any type of systematic review and that is really the extent of the search. Is it a comprehensive search? And this is really the only surefire way in how far and wide we search in that attempt to identify all of the available literature is our only real way to minimise, for example, publication bias. And that is, you know, the possibility that, that uh, some results aren't published in the mainstream journals because they're negative results, for example. Sometimes they're not published at all. I mean, we could do a lot of statistical tricks to minimise publication bias, but this is the best way to be sure of it, to be sure that we've searched as far as wide and possible, as possible. The search that we conduct will impact on the transparency and its reporting, as I mentioned, and the reproducibility of any review project. But this is really the big issue, and it's the big issue that researchers will look to librarians to guide them. And that is, where is it appropriate to search? How much is enough? How far and wide should I be looking? And just to prime you, the librarian, for what you will encounter from researchers, is that when we're talking about searching um, to inform systematic reviews and to undertake a systematic review project, well, we tell researchers that they should be using all sorts of sources of information. Yes, the scientific databases that have many of these scientific journals indexed therein, but then depending on the question, various organisations, the websites of those organisations, actual libraries, it might be even tapping into experts. Many systematic reviews will do that. And what will they find amongst these resources? Of course, the most common are the peer-reviewed journal articles. It might be the research or the, the opinion that's published there. Grey literature is an important one, the unpublished studies that systematic reviews should look for, as well as theses, dissertations. So much research is locked in theses and dissertations. So much of the research is conducted by higher degree and PhD research students around the world. Dependent on the question that's asked, it might be census data that's important, that's locked away in you know, country statistics, for example. But it all needs to be found to be able to inform a particular question. Some questions will lend themselves to this type of evidence, to looking in these sorts of places. Other questions won't. And we tell reviewers, everyone's heard of PubMed. Everyone has, who's in, in health research. A lot of people haven't heard of anything else. And when you open up this world of all of these different databases that are out there, many people are amazed. Many people are overwhelmed by the amount that's out there. There's just a snapshot, I'm sure you're aware of many more. Um, but it's certainly again at this point that we, or me, who often train systematic reviewers, I'll point the finger in your direction and say, now's about the time you better speak to your librarian. Similarly, when we talk about grey literature, often confuses a lot of systematic reviewers. What is it? What's it all about? Where do you find it? These are some of the tools we use to find grey literature, but again, we send them to consult with their librarian. And what will you see as a result of that process that we go through? Well, I see many systematic review protocols that after they've been informed about all the wonders of the information that's out there and all these places you can look and these major databases where you should search, I see protocols that tell me that they're planning to search PubMed, Medline, Web and Knowledge Scopus, for example. They've listed them all. And in essence, they're searching Medline four times. Is that really what they want to do? Maximise the, the amount of duplication? I think not. But many researchers will not know it because they've never invested the time to actually explore and find out what exactly is within these databases. This one I see often, a review of effectiveness that will search the Cochrane Library. Well, the Cochrane Library has a five or six different 
databases within it. There's the database systematic reviews, the database of abstracts of reviews and effects, the uh, health technology assessment database, the NHS economic evaluation database, um, and the methodological development database, the methodological reviews database. But the really important one for review effectiveness is Cochrane Central's trial register. That's really the only one of use to a systematic reviewer once they've established that their review hasn't already been conducted by the Cochrane Collaboration. Um, and also qualitative reviews. Well, the Cochrane Collaboration don't conduct qualitative reviews as of yet. So why would you search there? And these are the sorts of things where a librarian who's looking for these sorts of issues, or who comes across them, can actually save a review team a whole lot of time and unnecessary pain, for want of a better word. You know, often we set limits to our search to limit the size of a, of a particular project. But why? That needs to be justified. It might be you know, the time a particular intervention has been used or was introduced. But it is also super important that the international research is being identified. Despite the fact my question might be relevant to what I do in practice here, I should be looking to the international research evidence to inform that question. And I won't get there unless I'm looking in the right places. This always confounds particularly novice reviewers. By the end of their first systematic review, they have a much better grounding in the difference between the database that they're searching and the search platform that they use to search the database. I've heard so many times I'm going to do a search of Ovid. I'm, go so I'm going to search PubMed and Ovid Medline. Again, they look at these as two separate databases. This is another big problem and it's where we really rely on our research librarians in being able to make the most of these various platforms in the mastery of the different wildcard characters that they use and, and all the different tricks that are in there to be able to make the search strategy be as sensitive and specific as possible in relation to a systematic review process and, tr and trying to find the evidence that's available. But similarly, that works both ways. And whilst those many people conducting systematic reviews, I think you'll appreciate when you're working with them closely, knowing what you know as librarians, you will scratch your head and think these people should know a bit more about this if they're going to do this effectively. Likewise, I believe you can't really do the experiment unless you understand the tools you're working with. And that applies, to, as I said, to us, the researchers. But as I mentioned right at the start of this presentation, I think it is well worthwhile that librarians do inform themselves or have some idea of where this is all going in terms of the systematic review process itself and what actually occurs in those next steps of selecting studies, appraising the research, what's the key to appraising research, how data extraction or abstraction is conducted, and what are some of the, the overriding principles and methodologies of data synthesis. And we refer and I must admit, being a reviewer who now has come to understand some of the intricacies of searching, I feel much better placed to be able to do this sort of work myself. And I think you'll find, in speaking to many librarians, that similarly, a librarian who has some knowledge of the topic that's being investigated can add an incredible amount of value to the research process, especially in terms of again dealing with those concepts about a particular topic when moving from the question through to the search strategy and it may be worthwhile that when you sit with those researchers you know that review team that the first thing you ask them to do is give me the nature of the problem you know what are we talking about here what are the characteristics of these people what is the problem we hear even before you really focus in on that first question and it may be the time that you need to do a little bit of research yourself to inform yourself about the topic of interest and beyond the methods that we're talking about here and the methodologies.